joining us, you know, and popping in and I'll be adding them. And this is also streaming live on Facebook. So every week, if any of you by any chance miss one that you wanted to see, all you need to do is go to our Facebook page and rewatch the video there. And then I usually ask the host to go out and put their uh, links. So any links that they share here in our actual meeting, I ask them to go out and share those on Facebook as well so that you guys have the links available to you. So let's go ahead and start recording and we'll get started. All right, ladies. So welcome to our Teaching Tuesday this week with Joanne D is what I call her because I'm not even gonna try. Joanne, tell us your last name because I'm not gonna mess it up. Okay, it's Dykhausen. Dykhausen, Joanne yeah. Dykhausen. And this week is all about our personal fur babies. So I'm excited for all of you to be here to learn more about how to be communicating with your dogs because you can, and they do hide pain and they do have pain sometimes. It's kind of, you know, I look at dogs because I, I raised dogs when I was raising my kids and I look at it like, um, you know, when our children are infants and they're tiny, they can't communicate with you or tell you what's wrong with them. And so um, Joanne is going to be teaching us a lot about that today on how to realize when something's going on with your pet, you know, um, and for you to be able to be attentive to that. And I know anyone that has pets, especially today, um, you know, they're your kids. They're, you know, they're a huge part of your family and we want to be as attentive to them as possible. So um, Joanne and I met each other several months ago. I love what she does. She is such an expert in her industry. And we all have our own specific industries that is our lane. And this is hers. You know, this is really her lane. So um, if you find this video helpful, because she's going to be doing some demonstrations for us today um, on how to work with your animals. If you find this helpful and you have anyone that you know has animals, this would be a good share, you know, for them to share. Um, that way, if they do have additional questions or do want to learn more, um, they could always reach out to Joanne directly or you could introduce her to them. So Joanne, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let you take over. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Colleen. And happy Tuesday to everyone today. And I so appreciate you being here. And I hope it's much warmer in your part of the country than it is around the Chicago area today because it is freezing. And um, I'm sure Cheryl can um, relate to that as well. And so it's good seeing all of you on the call today. So I'd like to start my presentations with a question. And the question I have for you is, do you know that bloodhounds are the wealthiest breed out of all the breeds? Can any of you know that? No, you mean well, like f the most healthy? No, wealthiest. What's wealthiest? Because they're always picking up scents. <laughs> I I like, wait a minute, that. I didn't, Walked I didn't, right into it. <laughs> I didn't know that dogs were wealthy. Like, wait, come on. Is there a whole black market I didn't know about? Exactly. I just like, I just like to break the ice a little bit before I do my presentations. Um, That's perfect. Do not, your, do not put groan in the chat room or anything like that. So um, I'm so happy to be here because this is a subject that I absolutely love. Um, I did mention this on another call that I was on two months ago with uh, Colleen, but I'll say it again. Um, I left corporate America after 35 years because I felt I didn't want to do that anymore and decided I wanted to go into something I truly loved. And that was canine massage. And it happened, I had dogs throughout my childhood, ranging from German Shepherds, Silky Terriers, Collies, when Lassie was still around. And I know I'm aging myself, but I had all kinds of different um, Cocker Spaniels. So I loved animals from the day I was little. And because of the fact that I came, that my mom and dad came from big families, I was the only child out of all my cousins and kind of that. So my fur babies, my dogs were really my siblings, so to speak, in, in the sense, so I could talk to them. And it was great because they would never fight with me or anything like that. 
but my love for um, dogs increased when my husband was diagnosed with a debilitating disease and um, he had heard something or read an article that golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers are good for people with disabilities. And so needless to say, we were adopted by a nine week old golden retriever named Duke. And the rest is history. So when my husband passed and having no children of my own and having no siblings, Duke got me through some very difficult times. So when Duke started to age, I felt I wanted to give back to him everything that he gave to me. But as we all know, if you have any kind of animals, their love is so unconditional, you could never give them back half of what they've given to you. So I've kind of um, went to canine massage school because I felt that was the best fit for me at the time and was able to help him for the rest of his life as he got older and that kind of thing. So really excited about it, love it. I've been doing it for nine years. And what I wanna talk about today is several things. And I'm going to show you a couple demonstrations with my favorite dog, because he has no problems eating, has no physical ailments or emotional issues. So I will show you some demonstrations and you can use them on your own dogs or like Colleen said, share the video with someone that might be interested or maybe they're going through similar situations, okay? So let's get started. A lot of people, when I first started canine massage, I was kind of getting discouraged and disappointed and felt maybe this wasn't the good fit for me that I thought it was because everyone I met there at vendor shows or in person or other issues, they would say, well, I massage my dog. What do I need you for? And so I thought, well, how do you answer that? And my question, I kept questioning myself, like, what, what is going on? What's wrong? And they would show me how they massage their dogs and that kind of thing. And I kind of looked with interest on how they did it. And so finally, an aha moment sparked for me. And it said, they don't know they don't understand what canine massage is. And so those of you that have had massage, I know Colleen had mentioned um, a couple of months ago that she has massages and hers is used for therapy. So hers is probably a more deeper massage and dogs are the same way. In fact, we use the same methods, massage methods as human massage therapists. And those are the Swedish massage techniques, which we'll talk about in a little bit later. And so the importance of it is like, what do canine massage therapists do? Well, we work strictly with the muscles. So we work with the skin, we work with the connective tissues, we work with the muscles to help build and help the dog. Because like Colleen mentioned in the beginning, it is similar to having children, young kids because they can't communicate with you. So why do they need massage? Well, that simple, that question is pretty simple because they need it and they can't. So we can't physically sometimes see that they're having issues. Sometimes you'll see them limping. Sometimes you may see them quick to get up or they may not be stretching like they used to. A lot of things that can be going on in a dog's life. So we as their custodians, their owners, their caregivers, it's up to us to help them continue. Because just like humans, dogs can heal their own bodies, but they need our help in order to do that. And so that's why it's so important to go with massage. And massage should be considered a specialty. It should be as necessity as water, food, all their daily requirements, okay? You don't have to massage your dog every day, but it's good if you do at least once a week. If they're having problems, obviously, if you can't um, massage your dog yourself, then you would ask that a massage therapist would help you there. The one thing I do want to point out to everyone is that canine massage therapists 
do not diagnose. I've had so many people over the years come up to me and say, doesn't this feel like a kind of fatty tumor or something like that? I cannot answer that, nor would I, even if I knew, because it is totally out of our scope of practice. So if you ever went to a canine massage therapist, I would strongly suggest that if they ever said that to you or diagnosed something, that they should not be doing that. It's really, if you feel your dog's ill or doesn't seem right to you, you really should go to your vet to get an official diagnosis. After that, once we know what the diagnosis is, a lot of times we'll talk to the vets themselves and we'll have a conversation and the vet will give the approval or non-approval based on what the issue is, okay? If a dog is limping, we will not touch them at all. The reason for that is because with them limping, it could be a whole series of issues from neurological to physical to physiology, the whole nine yards. So we're not gonna work on a dog knowing that we could be doing more damage to a dog than helping the dog. Okay, makes sense so far? And one thing I wanted to tell you, and I apologize, I should have told you this um, at the beginning of the presentation. If you have any questions, I'll have a Q&A after the presentation. So just put any questions you might have in the chat box, and then I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, moving forward. There are certain times, and I'm going to talk a little bit, which is really a big issue in our country and in England as well. Um, I talked to a lot of vets, not vets, but canine massage therapists in England. And it's kind of interesting that we share um, our different ways of how we do things. So it's kind of cool. But the main thing that we're facing is osteoarthritis in your dogs. And these are the older dogs. And eight-year-old eight dogs and up, 60% of them hide their pain. 20% of dogs seven years and younger hide their pain. So what pain might your dog be showing you, but you're not paying attention to, okay? We're gonna talk about this. So does your dog seem less enthusiastic to go for a walk? Do they quickly slow down and seem easily distracted? Do they have to put lots of effort into standing up? If they stop stretching, you know, you see your dog will stretch in the front, they'll stretch in the back. Do they stumble, trip, or catch their toes when walking and you think, oh, they just tripped? It's really nothing to worry about. And has their body shape changed? Real interesting. So you'll find this very interesting because those issues that I just mentioned to you are a lot of reasons that people euthanize their dogs earlier than later. And you would be surprised, <clears throat> surprised, <clears throat> excuse me, at the stories I have heard over the past nine years. So it's not their fault. Again, people just don't know and don't understand. And that's why I love doing these presentations. So they'll say, well, the dog's just getting old, doesn't feel like doing anything. I mean, it would be basically talking about an elderly person. Maybe the elderly person would love to go out. Maybe they'd love to do things. I mean, I think there's things in our lives now that you wish you could still do. I mean, I'm embarrassed to do this, but I shouldn't be, but it's always been I worked, I volunteered at uh, a zoo up until two years ago, and they had this huge carousel there, and I wanted so bad to go on this carousel. I even wanted to rent a kid to get on there, you know, so I, it was like my grandkid or something. But there's so many things that dogs still want to do, and it sounds silly, but take them out in a wagon, you know, have them, you know, a lot of people I see when they're doing the stop and sniffing, they're really quick to pull them away. You know, let them do that. This is what they enjoy. So don't give up on your dog because they have these issues. Get them checked out because the majority of the time your dog is in pain and people are putting down their dogs 
way earlier than they need to. Okay. Now, some of the, um, one of the things is why do, what dogs benefit from massage? I don't think I have to tell you this, all of them do. From working dogs, from elderly dogs, even someone said to me, well, my dog's healthy. And I said, yes, but they can benefit from it because of one particular, which is the heart and soul of why I do these, is the fact that when you're massaging your dog intentionally, like you're not doing this and you're watching the TV or you're thinking, oh, I've got to do this after I, you know, massage, you know, my dog, or you come in and you've had a bad day, not the best time to massage your dog because your dog is picking up on your energy. And so they're not going to go anywhere near you more than likely. And so you really want to have that special time because that's your bonding time with your dog. And even if you've had your dog for a long time, this is awesome because you still can have that bond with your dog and you're strengthening your bond with your dog as you're doing that. So kind of find a quiet place where it's just you and your dog. If you have other dogs in, in your house, you may want to separate them and you could do them individually because you're not going to get a lot of work done if you have all these distractions. And you will see what I'm talking about in a little while. So the first thing is one of the, the benefits, the physical benefits are amazing and are numerous and they're too many for me to say here. So I'm only gonna say a few of them. Um, when we talk about range of motion, that's really getting your dog muscles to kind of like, if, especially if your dog's been laying around and is not as mobile as they used to be, you wanna get them motion. Walking, getting them around is crucial to their health. The same thing is with adults, with elderly adults, with all of us, really, at what age we are. You want to help that movement. If you're not moving them, you're getting them into muscle atrophy, and that you don't want to do. There are some times you can bring back some of the muscle mass that they have, but the majority of the time, you cannot get that back. So you want to make sure that they're mobile. So if they're not able to walk, you want to be able to massage your dog so that they're still getting that movement, okay? One of the massage techniques, which I won't show you today, um, which it really should be done by a canine massage therapist, is called a swimming exercise. So it actually gives the movement of your dog actually swimming, okay, which is great. And so that is giving them the movement that they so need. A lot of people will take their dogs to rehab, you know, because they have the treadmills and they have the water therapy and, and that's up to the vet to make that decision for you, okay? A lot of times we do the in-between. So let's just say your dog has um, rehab once every two weeks. Well, then we could come in during those two weeks and help the massage with the massage so that we work as a team and we all work together and we all know what's going on with the dog. And so one thing I do wanna to mention to you is the fact that there are certain dogs that we do not work on. One of them is if they have an open wound, you don't wanna work on your dog. If they have a fever, if they're pregnant, if they have cancer, there are certain types of cancer we can work on with vet approval, but most of the time cancer is not one of the areas that we work on. The reason being that we could possibly spread it because with our movements, and again, once you place your hand on your dog, no matter where you're touching your dog, all 11 of their organs are working simultaneously, which is amazing and fascinating, okay? Some of the other things is it's really good. Massage is good for a dog that say is having surgery tomorrow. And it's also good after surgery. Again, the vet will tell you when it would be an appropriate time. So mostly it's when the dog's healing. And what, you can, what we can do is 
minimize the scar tissue on the dog. And so if your scar tissue is this, we can shrink it to smaller and it's nicer because it also heals faster. The other thing is that if you're giving your dogs medicine, it is also important that it also helps spread the medicine quicker through the system. So there are just so many it aids in digestion. It makes their coat shiny. Again, we work with the skin, the connective tissue and the muscles. We also work with chiropr chiropractic vets. And so again, we work as a team to give you the best possible solution to your dog's illnesses. A lot of times, most dogs that I've run into have had back issues, hip dysplasia, osteoarthritis. So you may have a dog that is in that situation. So it's really important not to massage just the back legs because what's happening is that your dog is compensating for one leg in the back or perhaps both of them. So what, we, what they're doing is what we call front loading. So front loading is they're putting more pressure on their front legs. So their shoulders inside their um, shoulder blades are very tense. Their neck is very tense. And so it's really important that not just the back, but especially the front needs to be compensated by massage because their muscles in the front are very, very tight. And otherwise it's gonna cause a lot more pain somewhere down the road. Okay, the, um, the most important one, which I mentioned to you before that I was gonna talk about is that by massaging your dog, even if you're not a certified canine massage therapist, it's really important to do a weekly pet assessment. And I can offer that to you. Um, I'll put that in the chat where you can contact me and I'd be happy to send that to you. What it is, is a, a snout to nose evaluation. It takes you step by step what you need to look for in your dog. My most important thing that I urge pet owners to do is to um, look for lumps or bumps. And sometimes if you have a really hairy dog, you're gonna have a problem with that. So that's why it's so intentional to go deep into their, into their fur or, skin, you know, or hair and look for if anything's changed. Like you may feel something and say, well, that wasn't there this last week. So I'm just gonna keep an eye on it. And if you find it's getting bigger, you definitely wanna um, take it to your vet for diagnosis. Or if you have a vet appointment coming up, make sure you take your information with you. And what I would do, because vets are so busy nowadays, I would encourage you to keep a log of what you observed, when it happened, any other symptoms that you've noticed before your visit to them. Because this way you go in, you've got your journal, you've got your write-up, instead of having to explain it all over to the vet, say, okay, these are the issues that are happening. So my thought is, then you have more time with the vet to find out what they think. And you don't have, you're, waste, you know, you're not wasting your time, but it's, you're gonna have more time with the vet time than you will trying to explain it. Make sense? Okay. So the emotional benefit, so that is my big one with, with pet owners. Um, I've caught many lumps and bumps on dogs. Um, some are hard. When I went to canine massage school, um, I had to look for something on a dog. And of course, they gave me an English sheepdog to watch, which um, was kind of hard to do. <laughs> so, but I found it. But it was really funny because um, they also, dogs also have trigger points. I don't know if any of you know this. So it's, it's up to us to really go in there. And that's why I think you're starting to understand why massage is so important and why we do it with intentionality. So it's really important that we also help them with those trigger points. Um, also, before you do any massages, your dogs may have a specific condition. So you wanna make sure that 
the massages that I'm showing you today techniques are okay with your vet. Because some people have issues with their dogs in the back, but it's a spinal issue. And by me showing you something on the neck may be counterproductive to what you should be doing, okay? And again, um, I, I'll tell you this too, if you ever need a free consultation, I am happy to do that um, as your members of Lead Up For Women or anyone else that's listening to this video replay. Okay, emotional benefit. This is awesome. And so this is my favorite part. So it's really nice because when puppies are born, they have no bond with anyone. And so it's up to us to really get them acclimated to touch. And there's a crucial period between some canine massage school differs, but it's only like 15 to not two to four weeks difference. So usually it's like eight weeks to 16 weeks. It's called the socialization period. And so what happens is that your dog should be exposed to men, women, children, other dogs, and yourself, because you want to get them, you want to touch their paws. You know how many dogs do not like their paws touched? Many. And so you want to get in there and massage your dog. You want to touch them because it's also forming a bond of trust with you and that dog. Okay. It also helps them get acclimated to everyone else. It also gives them, and if you've had puppies and have been up at two or three in the morning, this will be amazing for you because it also helps their sleep patterns. And so that's a huge benefit, okay? We're getting close to what I'm gonna show you at the tips, but I do wanna show you five places on a dog you should never massage, and I'll explain why. So I'm gonna take my handy dandy dog here. Okay. The first one is this one I can do without the dog. Okay. We have a vagus nerve and dogs have vagus nerve. Our vagus nerve is like right behind the earlobe. The vagus nerve for the dog is in the ear, but it also comes down. Okay. So you have your carotid artery. Okay. And then you have, just make a V right here. So you're taking both hands and you're making a V coming down. And what you want to do is you never want to go in here really hard. Okay. And like people, you can, we call it palpation. It's like you can do it very light, but a lot of people will go in there and what it's doing, it's putting your dog into a fight or flight mode. And what happens is that it affects their lungs, their heart, and their digestive system. Again, if you look at a dog's eyes, and a lot of people think this is woo-woo, you can really tell by a dog's eyes that they're in discomfort. And so I advise you, dogs are giving us signals all day long, but are we looking for them? So what's really nice is that this is an area where you don't want to go into. There's a lot of veins, there's a lot of arteries, and there's a lot of nerves. So you don't want to go in there, okay? I've had people say to me, my dog loves it. Hey, Joanne. Well, your dog is probably immune to it. But it was, <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, Tell I think there's a, a little delay. Uh, a little delay on the internet there. Um, there was a question that Cheryl had. Uh, and uh, her question that she wrote in here was, can I work with my dog who has a debil debilitating bone disease? His back legs are tender and I'd like to massage the muscles, uh, but don't know if it will hurt him. Right. Good question, Cheryl. Um, what I would suggest to you is speak with your vet. Say, this is what I want to do. Would this be, or I don't know if you take your dog to a chiropractor um, or a vet. So I would number one, get approval there for that before you start any kind of massage technique. Okay. 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 Um, and then Kate had a question. She said, uh -huh. I have a dog and I'm going to do my best on this because I don't even know what this is. Okay. I have a dog with myasthenia gravis uh -huh. and esophagus. We have to feed her in a Bailey chair. 
She spends a lot of time sitting because of this. We do have a dog chiropractor come out about every eight weeks. We've noticed muscle loss in her back legs. Would a massage help support her back legs? So she's just asking about her back legs because she sits right. a lot. Okay, and that was Kate? Yeah. Kate, I would also, I'm not trying to pass it off to the vet, but again, um, I've had a dog that had that, but I did not work on him. Um, not that I did want to, it's just that I didn't. Um, but I would definitely ask your vet because if it is, if your dog is having muscle loss, um, a massage could help him. But again, you really wanna make sure that the vet is on board with this because again, like I said earlier, we work as a team and we would, I would not wanna do anything that would jeopardize um, anything else happening with your dog. So I hope that helps you a little bit. Yeah, my suggestion would be at that rate, Kate um, and Cheryl both, ask your vet um, what they, you know, if any type of massaging or rubbing would be okay in certain areas. And if they say, oh, absolutely, that could help a lot. Yeah. Then when Joanne puts her contact information here, reach back out to Joanne so she could do a one-on-one -on -one consultation with you yeah. to then direct you on what to do for your next steps. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great idea, uh, Colleen, too. And thank you so much. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is, obviously, you um, don't want Can you, you guys all see Joanne okay? Or do I need to spotlight her? Because she's pretty okay. wide on the screen. You see her okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. So the other thing, obviously, is the spine. You don't want to put... You can palpate, which is gently, but you don't really want to put a lot of pressure on on the dog, obviously, because there's a lot of vertebrae that you could break. So you don't really want to do that, okay? The other thing is you never want to massage in the elbow part, okay? You never want to do deep massage in there. Reason, these are called the brachial plexus nerves, and they have all kinds of arteries, veins, just like the V that we mentioned with the vagus nerve, so you don't really want to go in there and start pumping your dog like that. Okay, you can do the soft one, but never do it there. How many of you know where to find the pulse on your dog? Okay, it is in the back where the leg and the trunk come together. It's in this area here. You don't want to put your thumb there because their thumb has a different pulse. And so you want to put one of your fingers there. If you press a little bit, you'll be able to feel the pulse of your dog. You don't want to press down really hard because what it's going to do is spike their temperature. Okay. One of the other things I want to go back to the, brach um, the brachial plexus nerves is that this is really important because of the fact that you could actually be doing damage and you may not see it physically at first, but it can numb and throw your dog's balance off. Really crucial, okay? The last one I wanna mention is behind the knee. It's called the popliteal fossa, we have them. And what that's going to do, it will affect your dog's walking, running ability, okay? And again, I can give this information to you as well. So now the fun part. I'm going to show you a couple of techniques that you can use with your dogs. Now, if your dog has any specific issue, which I, Kate, I know we heard that, and uh, from Cheryl too. So people have told me, does the dog need to sit down or they need to lay down on their side. It doesn't matter um, because sooner or later, they're gonna go on their side. So one thing I do wanna tell you as pet owners is that never force your dog to have a massage because what you're going to be doing is that you're going to give them a negative thing that this is not fun. Why is she always dragging me over here? And that's what I find when I do my in-home visits, the people are dragging. I said, let the dog go because they will come back. They may just want, and our touch is different than petting. 
So you can still pet your dog, but you can incorporate these techniques as well, okay? So the first one technique is what we call effleurage, a Swedish technique, and it starts and ends with the massage. Very important thing before you touch the dog, take three deep breaths. What that's telling your dog is that you're kind of like bringing his feelings down as well. Okay, you can have a very excitable dog by breathing, but there's another technique I can show you that will also help calm that dog down. Okay, so the first technique and also the uplarage technique is what we call the transition technique. So anytime we do a different stroke, we always go back to the uplarage. So you're taking the palm of your hand and you're just from where the ears are, the neck part, you're going very slowly down their feet and off their feet. Make sense? Okay, do the same thing with the other side. We'll just pretend this is the other side. And you're going down the feet and off the paws. Same thing with here, going down the paws and off the paws. All right, make sense? So I would suggest doing this because most of the time if they're on their side, you're only gonna be working with one side at a time. Trying to get them over on the other side could take some work and willpower because I've done it with many dogs where we've had to literally like flip them <laughs> because they didn't want to move. Okay. Very important, why do we use the effleurage stroke? They use it in human massage is to really calm you down and take the anxiety, okay? The other thing I wanna show you, and some of you do this probably already, is the ears. So I want you to kind of make your like circles with your fingers right now, if you can, okay? So you're going to go your thumbs back here. You're not in the ear canal and you're making circular motions all the way off. Okay, you can do it on the other side. Some dogs will let you do it at the same time to both ears, other ones will not. You may find that your dog will do this at first but then if he does, that's fine or she, you just go down and do that effleurage stroke and then come back later, okay? Your dog is gonna give you a signal if he or she doesn't like something. So he, he or she's gonna have to get used to your touch and why you're doing things a little bit better. If they're hurting, the signal they will give to you, they will turn. Now, there's two indications with that. Either I'm going to bite you and, or what are you doing? Or it hurts back there. So they will give you a signal. That's why when we work on dogs, we work on dogs where their face is not towards us because of that safety precaution because we don't know your dogs as well as you do. Okay, so everybody understand that technique pretty well? Okay. We got time for maybe a couple more and then I will let Colleen take over. So the next one is the neck. And again, if your dog has any kind of issues, always check with your vet on this part. So have any of you heard like the itsy bitsy spider, like how you go up? Okay. So you wanna start at the base of the ear and what you're gonna do is you're gonna just lightly pull up some skin, release it, and move your thumb to the next part. Doesn't matter where, you're, where you start on the dog, I mean, how your thing is. So what you're gonna do is pick up skin, release it, move your thumb, slide it over. So it's kind of like your thumbs, the tractor wheels moving. So you're gonna pick up some skin, again, not heavy, because less is more. And you're gonna release it and move all the way to the end of the, of the other dogs, of the dog's ear. 
So what it is, again, some of your dogs can be have really tight skin there, but if you do this, eventually the, dog, the skin will get more pliable, okay? I must warn you, your dog may drive you crazy if you use this technique, okay? I've had many people hate me because their dog will come up to them all the time and want their neck rubbed, okay? So I'm not responsible for that. I'm just giving you the heads up on this one. So the other one, we're talking about a dog that has anxiety. So say your dog is really wound up. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna match your strokes to the energy of that dog. So let's say this dog is really hyper. So we're gonna go, we're, we're matching his actions, okay? And then we're gonna eventually start slowing it down, okay? Really good. So you're gonna keep going, you're gonna keep going, and then you can see them start to calm down a little bit, and then you just go back to your regular effleurage strokes, okay? So there's one more thing. I got four more minutes, so I wanna show you this one. This is for dogs that don't like all the foo-foo stuff. Can't be bothered with it. This is called a zigzag touch. And what you do is you're gonna take your fingers on the side of the spine, never on the spine like we talked about, and you're gonna open up your hand and go down, like in a zigzag stroke like this. So as you're going down, you're opening your hands, when you're coming up, you're closing. When you're going down, you're opening. When you're coming up, you're closing. Now, some of your dogs, again, will let you do this at the same time on both sides. Other times, they will not let you do that. So again, your dog is specific, just like we are individuals and unique. So is your dog. Your dog's not like anything else. Anyone else, I shouldn't say anything else, anyone else. So again, what's the first thing that we do before we even touch the dog? Breathe, <laughs> okay. The other thing is, and people find this very strange, do you, you ask your dog if they want a massage? Now, the dog's not gonna turn around to you say, hey, sounds like a good idea, let's do it. What they're gonna do is two things. They will walk away from you or they will come to you. And don't be alarmed when you're massaging your dog if they get up after five minutes and walk away because I will guarantee your dog will come back to you at some point. So um, that's really the end of my presentation. I don't know if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask me. Can I and ask you? Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Cheryl, I can say what I needed. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, when you say, ask them if they want to massage, it's almost like you want to go for a walk, you yes. want to treat, that yes. kind of thing, and yes, get that reaction, get you'll get verbal cue that this is massage time. Okay. Well, it's funny. One time I went to a dog and I said, Do you want a massage? And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> So I said, I guess that means yes. But no, they will walk away from you. And um, the only thing I urge parents, like I mentioned before, owners is not, not say, come here, come here, come here. Just if that's all they want, let them be because they're not used to your touch. They're not used to what you're doing. So I will be happy to send all of you a copy of these exercises. I will be happy to send you a, um, the pet assess, weekly pet assessment. And um, I can send you some other information as well if you're interested. Um, I will put my information in the chat if you'd like to. Oh my goodness. Oh, Cutest you... photo bomb ever. <laughs> <laughs> See, you could have been working on him, Missy. <laughs> um, so I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, it was great having you on here. Um, again, don't hesitate to call me, even if it's six months from now, I would be happy to talk to you free of charge because I love what I do. And if I can help your dog and you have better peace of mind and that they can live a happier and healthier life, 
then I've done my job. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with all of you here today. Okay, Joanne, what we need is for you to put all your contact information in the chat, first okay. of all, because it's not there. So I need you to put all the inf all your information in the chat. Um, and then Kate said she would love a pet assessment and a copy of those exercises. Mm -hmm. So she put her uh, email in here as well. And of course, Joanne, I'll send you a copy of the chat after this. Oh, awesome. um, as well as um, as well as the recording. But um, any of you might want to sit once Joanne drops her information in there, you might want to save the chat or copy her information so you have it. Um, so Joanne, you definitely want to reach out to Kate um, so that you guys can connect. And I thought this was a really great presentation of, you know, what where what you're able to help people do with their dogs that are healthy how you work with vets if they're unhealthy or have some type of disease or if they're struggling with something because it's the same, right? You know, if we're, I remember calling my masseuse when I was sick and my masseuse said to me, um, I could massage you, <laughs> but it can make your symptoms worse. It can help you get better, but it can make your symptoms worse. And she said, so I don't think it's the right thing for me to be doing that right now. I really think you need to consult with your physician or whoever you're working with. And then once you're feeling a little bit better, let's now then we'll work from that point forward. So I appreciated her saying that because I didn't know, you know, right. here I am just sore because I had been in bed all week and throwing up and every muscle in my body was aching. And I just needed like someone to give me some relief. But she was saying like, this could make it worse you know, releasing all those toxins in your body or whatever. So it was, it was, I'm glad she said that to me. So I waited yeah. a week until I got better after that. And then I went and saw her. And so it didn't cause any problems. So I appreciate you not just telling people to jump right in and start rubbing their dogs in areas that could make it worse. Right. You know, and the tips yeah. I shared today were really basic techniques. I mean, it's not what we go into the deep massage, that kind of thing, because I really think that's more geared toward a canine massage therapist, someone that's more um, professional. But um, these basic techniques that I've shown can be done with the dogs, and it's, it's just awesome. And I just have met so many awesome people in the past nine years, and especially their dogs, except yeah. I, tend, I tend to remember the dog's names. <laughs> more than the owners. So I have yeah. to apologize to the owners for that. That's okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up for today? Go ahead, Cheryl. How far do you, where does, what is your area that you work in? I'm asking because I know somebody in Rockford okay. who would be very um, interested. I would at least like to give her this recording for this information, but also too, if you work in that area, I'd like to send your contact. <laughs> Um, I could, we could also do a Zoom call where okay. she could, um, we could have just basically what I've been telling you today and go through an actually canine massage session on a Zoom call and she could be working with her dog as we're going along. And so it's kind of nice because you can see them doing, working on their dogs and kind of correct, kind of say, we'll try this way or try something. Um, so it's kind of like a personal one-on-one, -on -one. but you know, I've been to Rockford, so it depends on my schedule and my time availability, but okay. I usually, I will not go to Arizona unless I fly there. <laughs> but, well, um, actually, but I, I will do. be there in March, so that'll be nice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but thanks, Cheryl. I appreciate that. And I do want to follow up with you because actually that might be a really nice gift to give her, to at least okay. work via Zoom with her. Um, because she's right now doing hydrotherapy with her dog. And okay. I think it'd be really great. So we do need to talk. Um, yeah, I and it, could my... be, it, it could be done between um, her, her therapy sessions um, or her rehab sessions. And uh, we'll see where that goes, you know? And okay. again, talk to the vet. If that's a, if that's a goal, then I'd be happy to, to work with her. Okay. So thanks, Cheryl. Great. I appreciate it. Sure. All right, sounds good. Cheryl, you can um, 
you can forward your um, friend, if she's on Facebook, you can forward her the link to the video, or I can just copy you when I send the email to Joanne, and then that way you'll get the link and you'll have it. Yeah, okay. that'd be great because she's not on Facebook. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just do that. So I'll give you the Zoom link. Yeah, I'll thanks. just give you the Zoom link. All right, ladies. Well, thanks for joining us today. Oh, before you go, I wanted you to know that next week, uh, let me copy and paste this real quick in here. Let me get the link. I'm actually teaching. That's a rare thing. I have not, I don't think I've taught one teaching Tuesday since I started these two years ago. So I'm actually teaching next week. So it'll be on, what is that? Tuesday, the um, Tuesday, the 23rd. Um, and I'm going to be teaching on living your life by design versus living your life by default. So I'm going to be bringing a lot to next week. Uh, so I hope that you can all join us uh, for learning how to do that. Just some simple tweaks in your life that you can do to, um, it's not really living it on purpose, but it's about designing it versus um, living just by things that happen to you every day. So I'll be teaching on that next week, uh, which will encompass a lot. And we hope you guys can join us. I dropped the link in there so you can just go ahead and schedule next week's. Uh, it's free. And then anyone that you know would be interested that maybe isn't even a member of Lead Up that would just want to jump in here and, and learn a little bit more, please feel free to invite them. All right, Joanne, thank you so much for being our uh, member host today. We appreciate you and all that you bring to the table. And ladies, we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care and have a Great. wonderful week. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great week. Bye, Kate.